Today on Fox Saturday Baseball, we've got some freakishly good pitchers taking the hill. In the Bay Area, two-time Cy Young Award winner Tim Lincecum takes aim at one of the best offenses in baseball, the Cincinnati Reds. Bob Philly, another Cy Young winner, Cliff Lee toes the rubber for the NL East leading Bills as they host the Chicago Cubs. And up north, reigning AL MVP Josh Hamilton and the first place Rangers take on Justin Morneau and the Minnesota Twins. It's all coming at you right now on Fox. Welcome to the Sprint pregame show on Fox. Sprint, all together now. For the second straight week, we are at the home of the defending world champs. A beautiful afternoon for baseball as a pair of playoff teams from a year ago go at it. The first place Giants face the reigning NL Central winners, the Cincinnati Reds. And earlier today, Legends Day is Will the Thrill and Sean Dunstan sharing some laughs. Red skipper Dusty Baker played for the Giants in 84. And how about this? Will the Thrill going spikes high on Dunstan. One of the best arms in baseball. Still good enough to turn the DP as they were having a whole lot of fun. And with that, hi everybody. We welcome you to another live edition of Fox Saturday Baseball from the Bay Area. In just a few minutes, some of you will stay out west to see game three of a four-game set between the Reds and the Giants. Mike Leake facing the two-time Cy Young Award winner, Tim Lincecum. Others will be shipped across country to see if the Cubs can get it pointed in the right direction behind their fine young shortstop, Starlin Castro. They lost last night to the Phillies thanks to a grand slam by Placido Polanco. And the rest of you will see the reigning AL MVP, Josh Hamilton, and the West leading Rangers face Michael Kadire and the Twins, who have won seven of their last nine. Back out here in San Francisco, the Giants won Friday night in walk-off fashion, but they lost another key cog to their offense, second baseman Freddy Sanchez. Already, without Pablo Sandoval and Buster Posey, Sanchez dislocated his right shoulder on a diving attempt. He's going to be out for an indefinite period of time. He's going to have an MRI later today. His roster spot has been taken by the veteran Bill Hall, who was released last week by the Houston Astros. Well, you know, speaking of Giants injury news, it was on this very field two and a half weeks ago. They're at home plate where Buster Posey was lost for the season following a collision behind the dish. So a lot of you are probably wondering, what is it like for a major league catcher as a runner is rounding third and heading for home? Let's get a first-person account from the two-time all-star catcher of the Chicago White Sox, A.J. Perzinski. When there's a play at the plate, oh man, where, where do I start? First of all, you hope it's a little guy coming. You always peek at the third base coach out of the corner of your eye because sometimes they'll stop him. You always want to know what you got. You know the guy's coming to get you. Then you look at the throw. The throw's coming. You hope you get in time because you don't want to be reaching for the ball. You got to kind of let it get to you. And the biggest thing I've always been taught and I always tell people is you got to catch the ball because if you don't catch the ball, you get run over and you get hurt. You're sore the next day, and you don't get the out. At least if you catch the ball, you can show it to the guy in his face and be like, yeah, you're out. You tried to get me, but at least you're out. Once you catch the ball, you try to get your bare hand on it so it's not in your glove, and you just take it. Just roll with it. You try to get your spikes out of the ground, and you try to get as low as you can and just let them hit you and just go with it. Man. As a catcher, it's probably the best feeling when you know that the guy's out. As long as you get up and you're okay. You took the guy's best shot, and you have the ball, and he's out. The amazing thing about A.J. Pierzynski is his durability. In 11 Major League seasons, he has yet to appear on the disabled list. All right, let's get you all caught up on what's happening earlier today around the bigs. But first, show you what happened last night between the Indians and Yankees. Fausto Carmona, after giving up a home run to Curtis Granderson, drills Mark Teixeira between the two and the five. Benches empty, and look at the managers, Joe Girardi and Manny Acta going point for point. Easy. There were no ejections in that game. So then, how about today? A-Rod off of Mitch Talbot, his 13th of the year, to get the Yanks on the board. Next at bat by A-Rod. Talbot plunks him. Is immediately ejected. Now, Talbot tells the home plate umpire, Dan Iasonia, I slipped on the wet mound. Look at Iasonia. He says, I don't care. You got to go, pal. And the Yankees go on for the 4-0 win. We will have complete scores and highlights during your game throughout Major League Baseball, including the Boston Red Sox as they try to win their eighth straight. But up next, we're going to get you out to your game. Some of you stay out west to see the world champs take on the Cincinnati Reds. Others are off to the city of brotherly love for the Cubs and the first place Phillies and the rest of you. We'll see the Rangers and the Twins from the Twin Cities. We'll get you out to your game next. 
on Fox. Sold out every Giants home game at AT AT&T Park so far this season, and today no different on a sun splash Saturday afternoon. Fox Saturday Baseball presents the defending world champion San Francisco Giants entertaining the defending National League Central Division champion Cincinnati Reds. And hi again, everybody. I'm Tom Brenneman. Welcome, as always, to Baseball on Fox. Well, the first two games of this four-game series has very much resembled a playoff series. Cincinnati winning a tight one on Thursday night. The Giants getting yet another rally in the bottom of the ninth inning to win by a run here last night. It's a pleasure to be joined again three straight weeks by Eric Karos. We've seen these Reds three straight weeks. They know they can hit. You've seen the Giants a lot. We know they can pitch. Well, pitch it can. And today they send two-time Cy Young Award winner Tim Lincecum to the mound. Now, his last two starts, he's been a little suspect. But the bottom line, when the Giants give him three runs of support over his career, 49-4. and four. The Reds, they're going to score. There's no question about it. And right now, Joey Votto. He's doing it again. The 2010 MVP is getting on base at a 460 clip. We see a Cy Young Award winner against an MVP Award winner. Well, if today is anything like the first two games of this series, this should be fun to watch. Lincecum bringing the heat to Votto, Bruce, and the Reds. First pitch coming up next. You're watching baseball on Fox. Reds and the Giants in game three of a four-game weekend series. And Dusty Baker, the one-time San Francisco Giants manager, has his Reds knowing they're in for a battle against Lincecum and the Giants. Let's take a look at the starting lineup for the Reds, brought to you by Taco Bell. Think outside the bun. Drew Stubbs will lead it off in center field. Brandon Phillips at second with Joey Votto, the reigning most valuable player at first. Jay Bruce, the reigning player of the month in May, is in right. Scott Rowland at third and the one-time giant Freddie Lewis in left. The latter third of catcher Ryan Hannigan, Paul Yanish, the Cincinnati shortstop, and Mike Leak is on the mound. Tim Lincecum, five up, four down, ERA under three. And, of course, reached the 1,000-strikeout plateau in just his 136th game, his last time out. Yeah, devastating fastball when he's got the velocity, but also that split finger forkball. He calls it a change, but it just drops right off the table. As you mentioned, that's what allowed him to get to his thousandth strikeout so quickly. Well, here it is, the old scouting report. For Lincecum to be effective, he's got to keep the ball down. When he's down, it just darts in the zone and hitting, not a lot of fun. We've got to watch the velocity. His last two starts, he's been 90-91. When he's dominant, he's somewhere in the mid-90s, 94-95. The defensive alignment for the Giants behind Lincecum, brought to you by Scott. Cody Ross, Aaron Rowan, Nate Sheerholz, left, center, and right. Miguel Tejada, Brandon Crawford, the rookie at shortstop. Emmanuel Burris replaces the injured Freddie Sanchez with a dislocated shoulder in the game last night. Aubrey Huff at first and a battery of Lincecum and Eli White, of course, who is filling in for the injured Buster Posey. Our opening pitch is brought to you by Budweiser. Great times are waiting. Grab some buds. So here we go in front of a sellout crowd. It's interesting to know the Cincinnati Reds are the only National League team that Tim Lincecum has never defeated. Now, he did not pitch against them last year, but in two career starts, in 13 innings, has allowed seven earned runs. Bruce Stubbs looks at ball one up and in, and we're underway. One and other count on Drew Stubbs and a swing and a miss. We welcome those of you waiting on the Cubs and the Phillies. Understand they're having some weather problems in Philadelphia. So when that game starts, if it starts, we'll get you to that game right away between the Phillies and the Cubs. One and two to Drew Stubbs. Stubbs among the fastest players in all of baseball. Possesses 
Very good power, great speed, but strikes out a lot. He leads the league in that category, and he's gone swinging to begin the game. Well, here Tim Lincecum just goes with the high fastball, and if you're throwing 90, 91, guys aren't going to catch up to it in that location. Just blows Stubbs away. Why well, to bring up an all-star second baseman a year ago, Brandon Phillips, and so far in the fan balloting this year, he is the overwhelming leading vote getter among all National League second basemen. A 292 batter, five home runs and 34 batted in. We we're talking before the game. I'm not sure there is a more fan-friendly player in all of baseball today than Brandon Phillips. Two and zero oh on Brandon Phillips. We we're talking about Phillips, who's a big fan of Twitter. But boy, does he make the most of it. Case in point, this weekend, about three weeks ago. He sent out a tweet. I think that's what you call it. <laughs> and he asked a question. He said, for anybody that can guess my jersey number when I played high school football, you'll have a very special treat. There's a ground ball to shorten there, two outs of the inning. Well, two young men who grew up in Cincinnati. One is now a freshman at Duke. The other is a freshman at Indiana University. They guessed 22. And it was a guess they had no idea. They were correct. And as a reward, Brandon Phillips flew the two of them out here to San Francisco to spend the entire four day weekend during the four game series hung out with them all day long yesterday along Fisherman's War. That's some commitment right there. That's that's some goodwill. You're not going to find that very often. I mean, you know, you playing a ball game, still spending time with the fans. Quite a young man. Well, now the reigning National League most valuable player, Joey Votto, with two outs and nobody on, a 333 batter, leads the league in walks. And leads the league in intentional walks. 0 oh 2. Trying to put Votto away in a perfect first inning, and a fastball is high. Lincecum is about a week and a half away from his 27th birthday. Born in Bellevue, Washington, still makes his home in the greater Seattle area. Cy Young Award winner in 2008, again in 2009. Roy Halladay snatched it away from him last year. But clearly has been among the game's elites, and today he came to the big league. Oh, he really has. And a bit unconventional, not big in stature, We can flat out bring it. In the air left field, Cody Ross is there, and the Reds retired in order. Lincecum is still not allowed a first inning run all year. The starting lineup brought to you by Taco Bell. Think outside the bun. Manny Burris for the injured Freddie Sanchez at second. Miguel Tejada at third. Aubrey Huff at first. Cody Ross, a cleanup batter. Nate Shearholtz in right with Aaron Rowan in center. A ladder third of Brandon Crawford. Eli Whiteside and Tim Lincecum. Against Mike Leak, a year ago became the 21st player since the advent of the draft to go straight from amateur ball and into the major leagues. Yeah, right out of Arizona State, had a lot of success. You know, this year it's been a mixed bag. You know, we'll take a look here at the, the scouting report. He's got to get the ground balls. He's a sinker ball pitcher. Go for it. And what that means is since his recall from the minor leagues, he's had three quality starts. He's looking for his fourth today. Well, we told you earlier that Lincecum has never beaten the Reds. The Giants in a couple of starts last year against Leak just knocked him all over the ballpark. Once in Cincinnati and once here. He gave up 11 earned runs in a total of four and two thirds innings. Well, Manny Burris now takes a knee high on the outside corner. One ball and one strike. Talked about Freddie Sanchez, another giant who goes to the disabled list. He dislocated his right shoulder, attempting to take away a base hit last night. He is a 12th different giant to land on the disabled list this year. And really, you, know, you look at their best three offensive players. Posey gone for the year. Sanchez out indefinitely. 
and they hope to have Pablo Sandoval back the early part of next week when they uh, take on Arizona. Bruce Stubbs in short left center for the out. And what had happened, you knew right away, Eric, that he was seriously hurt. Well, by the way he reacted, and it looks harmless right there. Just the way he slides. You, know, you don't see anything bending awkwardly. or But the way he reacted, he was just done right away. Shoulder dislocation. Bruce Bochy telling us that he's going to go for an MRI today. But he's going to be out for quite a while. And of course Sanchez missed the first six weeks of this season recovering from left shoulder surgery the third time he had had surgery on that shoulder in the last 14 months. Well now Miguel Tejada. Going back to his days in Houston Tejada has always owned Cincinnati pitching a career 371 batter against him. There was talk two days ago that Tejada was maybe down to his final days as a giant. That when they get Sandoval back, that perhaps he could be released. And he has just worn it out in this series, although not his first time up today. Two out. The Reds among the best defensive teams in all of baseball, and their defense brought to you by Scott's. Rolling a gold glove winner last year. Phillips a gold glove winner last year. They had a pitcher win a gold glove. And most believe a gold glove would be in the future of not only Stubbs, but also Jay Bruce and Wright. Red's very athletic. Bottom line, as you mentioned, they do catch the ball. That's the biggest difference at this level. I mean, you give a team four outs and it becomes a nightmare. It becomes a nightmare for your pitching staff offensively. You're always playing from behind. You know, we always focus pitching stats, hitting stats. You catch the ball, you're in business. Two now, nobody on. Aubrey Huff, the batter, a 228 hitter with eight home runs and 32 runs batted in. Giants come rolling in, 36 up, 28 down. They are the pace setters in the National League's Western Division. They were flipping back and forth. The early part of the week with Arizona till the Diamondbacks had to leave the West and go back East and they've been kicked around by the Pirates. And by the Florida Marlins in a series opener last night. I think it's more of a case Arizona getting hot. They, they thrust themselves into the top of the division. But this giant ball club, I mean, they're built for the long haul, especially with this pitching staff. Now, I'm not talking about just the starters. Let's come a one two three inning leak a one two three inning move to the second in San Francisco in a scoreless game from Citizens Bank Park see the grounds crew out and they've had rain the entire morning and if they get started in Philadelphia we'll get some of you there. Reds come to bat top of the second inning against Tim Lincecum in a scoreless game. Jay Bruce, Scott Rowland, Fred Lewis do up for the Reds. Jay Bruce, a National League's player of the month in May. I mean, he led the world in virtually every category over that month. Power, RBI. You know, and teams were still pitching around Joey Votto to get to this man. That just shows you what respect they have for Joey Votto. Two and oh to Bruce. And that one is over the head of the shortstop. They were swung around to play Bruce as a pull hitter. And he's aboard first base runner for either team today. Just a 2 0 fastball down the middle of the plate. Jay Bruce isn't going to let that go by. Again, when you're facing one of your top pitchers, you're gonna you might see one pitch in that bat. Now look at look at that month of May. In the 13 home runs, 36 RBIs, and really carried that team offensively. Now the third baseman Scott Rowland. He started the last couple of games after missing four in a row. 
with an infected throat. That ball has popped up into foul ground, and who wants it? Tejada's in. And Roland quickly taken care of for the first out of the inning. Today's game presented by Sprint is sponsored by Taco Bell. Think outside the bun. And by Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. One out, one on here in the red second inning, and that'll bring up a former San Francisco Giant. Freddie Lewis in his first year with the Reds after spending last year in Toronto. Now teams have been running pretty much at will when you get on base against this very talented giant staff and you say staff because you brought up earlier not only their starters but their relievers. Opponents have stolen successfully 20 of their last 23 attempts against San Francisco pitching and catching. Well and Tim Lincecum over the course of his career has been vulnerable. Last year teams just ran wild this year though. He's already caught six guys. I shouldn't say he catching while he's been on the mound. And there he goes. And they'll never throw a Bruce out. No, and this this is stolen off Tim Lincecum. I mean, you're the catcher. You just got to eat that. Jay Bruce getting a great jump. Linscombe not quick to the mound. And you mentioned those six caught stealing with Linscombe on the mound. That's the most in Major League Baseball. And that one gets through the catcher and all the way to the backstop that will advance Jay Bruce on to third. So all of a sudden you go from a leadoff single. You get a quick out. A stolen base. And we'll see how this is scored. It'll be a wild pitch and a runner standing at third. Well, this looks like it hits the plate instead of bouncing up, just stays down. Eli Whiteside doesn't get the glove down on the ground. You'd like to have the knees drop, glove on the ground. Little space, ball eats through. Well, now the Giants going to bring their infield in. That gives you an idea about what they think of their own offense right now with all the injuries and, and all the guys really laboring to score. I mean, during this... Eight game homestand only one time have the Giants in the eight games scored more than three runs. And here's ball four to Lewis. So the Reds have him on the corners against Lincecum with one out here in the second inning. And Ryan Hannigan coming up. All right, Eric. Let's take a look at our four keys to the game. Well, if you're the Reds offensively, when you go up there to face Tim Lincecum, you want him to get the ball up in the zone. When he's down, he is very tough to hit. Giants, it's very simple. You've got a guy like Tim Lincecum on the mound. You go out, you score him three runs. As I mentioned, they are 49 and four. There are guys you would naturally think you'd want at the plate long before the man who digs in right now, Ryan Hannigan, in a situation like this. But Dusty Baker might tell you, after Joey Votto, Hannigan might be the next guy you want up there simply because of the fact he generally puts the ball in play. Well, he puts the ball in play, and he's not afraid to have the ball travel deep. And what I mean by that, he lets the ball get on him. He'll inside out it. He'll shoot it to right center. He's not up there trying to pull the ball or hit the ball out of the park. Now, the last couple of Saturdays, we've seen these Reds, and we've seen them in situations frequently like this with Hannigan at the plate. And almost every single time we see them, they will start a runner with Hannigan and play a little hit and run. And also not a bad situation to do that with a guy like Lincecum on the mound who is susceptible to the running game. Whiteside has had all kinds of trouble throwing. I'm not sure, though, I move. I, I, give, I give Hannigan a few pitches to to do something at the plate. Two balls and no strikes.
Reds come in 33 wins against 32 losses. Last week for the first time in two years they slipped into third place but they're only five behind St. Louis. The Cardinals were shut out yesterday by the team behind them in the central the Milwaukee Brewers. Three and oh. Again, this is going to sort of sound crazy with your number seven hitter up, but I'm Tim Lincecum right now. I'm, almost, I'm not giving him anything good to hit. I'll start over with the bases loaded with Paul Yanish up. Janish. And there's a strike. So three and one now to Hannigan. Taking a long look down at Cincinnati third base coach Mark Berry, who will walk up and whisper something into the ear of the runner at third, Jay Bruce. I still, even three and one with Giannis on deck, I, I don't go after him. Back up the middle in the center field, a base hit, and Cincinnati has a 1 0 lead. I talk about Hannigan, he doesn't play every day. Hannigan. Shares time with Ramon Hernandez, but he will put the ball in play here and a base hit to knock in the game's first run. Well, and that's why I say this is a 3-1 fastball right down the middle. And that's why I kept saying it. you don't go after him in that spot. Throw the, the change or the, the splitter, throw something off speed, but you can't just lay a fastball in there in that situation. You've got Giannis up now, light hitting shortstop. And, you know, this is the guy you should have gone after. Giannis a 222 batter without a home run and 16 runs batted in and Lincecum falling behind virtually every batter here in the second inning after making it look real easy against three good hitters in the first. One and one. Of course, we'll see how this one plays out, but a very good start for Cincinnati, and they continue to talk about it. They continue to write about it here in San Francisco. Going back to the 133 pitch outing that Lincecum had four starts ago in a complete game, 3 0 shutout of the Oakland Athletics. He had a pretty good start his next time up in Milwaukee against a very good offensive club. A particularly good offensive club at home. But his last two starts, he's worked a total of 11 and a third innings and allowed nine earned runs. Well, a season high in hits allowed to the Cardinals with 10. Then a season low in innings pitch, five in his last start. You talk to some and they say, well, it may have been the pitches, and others are talking about the mechanics. Bottom line, he hasn't been the typical Tim Lincecum the last two starts. Ball to behind Giannis, three balls and a strike. And the count runs full and a fastball on the inside edge. Fred Lewis, a runner at second base. Ryan Hannigan on at first base. Reds have scored a run. On a couple of hits, a walk in a wild pitch here in the second inning and looking for more. Slow roller, and they get one. They throw and get the double play. Well done by the rookie Brandon Crawford. And that gets Lincecum out of major trouble in the second inning. The red score run and lead 1-0. As are the skies. They've removed the start, and uh, in just a little while, we hope to bring in Matt Garza and the Cubs against Cliff Lee and the Philadelphia Phillies. So stick around when that game gets started. For those of you waiting that game and waiting on that game, we'll get you there. Here, are the Reds and the Giants move to the bottom half of the second inning, and Cincinnati has a 1 0 lead. Cody Ross, Nate Sheerholtz, and Aaron Rowan against Mike Leak. Strike one. 
What a ride it was for Cody Ross, especially over the last couple of months of last year. I mean, roughly in about 60 days, he went from an afterthought with the Florida Marlins. Good player, but I mean, certainly not a household name. Became a giant, took over as their starter, and became a postseason hero. The league championship series most valuable player and led the Giants to their first ever World Series title since moving to San Francisco in 1958. You know, and those are the sort of things that a team needs or an organization needs to, to win a world championship. Bottom line is you need a little bit of good fortune. You know, and you talked about the success that Cody Ross had last year. Well, remember also, September, Jose Guillen was playing outfield out here. He had the issue. He goes. Ross gets the job, and then he runs with it. All right, they're ready to get started in Philadelphia. Let's send it back to Joe Buck and Tim McCarver for the and the Phillies. First four batters retired today by Mike Leake, and now he faced Sheerholtz, the hero in the bottom of the ninth inning here last night. With the bases loaded and two men out, he had a single into left field against Logan Andrusik to win it for the Giants in a 3-2 game. Well, here it is. He just shoots that ball to left field. Torres scores. You know, Sheerholtz has had some moments this year. Had a big home run. He's made a, a game-saving catch against the Dodgers to end the ball game. You know, athletically, he has the tools to play every day, but he just doesn't put it together on a consistent basis. I mean, the wins for the Giants here at home have just been remarkable. I mean, last night was their ninth walk-off win in 29 home games so far this year. Broken bat floater in the right field, a base hit. The Giants have a base runner for the first time against Mike Lee. Today's game presented by Sprint is sponsored by Budweiser. Great times are waiting. Grab some Bud. So now Aaron Rowe in the batter. Who has lost his regular job as their everyday center fielder going back to last year? The last two days he's gotten starts, only seven of those over the last month for Aaron Rowan. Has such an odd approach and setup before the pitch is thrown, doesn't he? Well, the way he holds the bat, you just figure there's no way that this guy is going to hit. Kind of grips it like he's holding a, a tree trunk or something with his arms. He's got that wide stance, but he gets himself into a hitting position. It's not where you start it's when you get loaded. And it reminds me, I mean, not the similarity in stances, but remember the great hitter Rod Crew, Hall mm -hmm. of Famer? He used to lay the bat almost flat on his back. I wonder how the heck does that guy hit? But when the pitcher's getting ready to release it, that bat would raise. He'd get into a hitting position. Very similar as far as Aaron Rowan. Right before the ball is released, he does get into a hitting position. Like I said, this stance, though, I mean, even the guys. I mean, I'm his teammates, watching it. Yeah, even his teammates will, will make cracks about it. But that just, that's not what you want to teach the little leaguers. Well, sure holds not a major threat to steal a base. He'll get one for you every now and again. Three out of six so far.
Leak a long look in. Okay's assigned with Hannigan, and now the 1 1 to Rowan is off the outside corner. Jeff Nelson, our home plate umpire today. Mike Estabrook is at first, Bill Welke at second, and Tim Sheeta works at third. Two and two. You and I were talking yesterday. It really is amazing to sit down and look at the San Francisco Giants from strictly an offensive standpoint. And you look at the numbers, especially their numbers hitting here at home at AT&T Park. The individual numbers where they are not only batting average but the home runs the RBIs the on base percentage and you immediately ask the question how in the world are these game guys eight games over 500 now naturally you say okay well they got the pitch but even still the offense has been so poor it's remarkable what they're doing but remember where they play their games they play their games in a defensive minded ballpark. You're not going to score a lot of runs. So when teams like the Reds or any offensive minded club comes into a ballpark like this, those seven, eight runs that you put up, that's not happening. It's going to be a one, two run ball game. The thing with the Giants, they stay close. They stay close because of their pitching. A play here, a timely hit there, they end up winning ball games. You know, and the thing also, they did it all year last year. So it's not one of those things where. They wonder if they can do it this year. They know they can do it. And they've continued that trend. They believe that if they stay close, we'll win a one run ball game. And boy, that they do. They are 18 and 9 in one run game so far this year. Two and two to Rowan. Swing at another foul ball. I mean, their starters ERA among all starting staffs in Major League Baseball, including Philadelphia, including Atlanta. Number one in ERA. And you know what the amazing thing is? They're number one in ERA in Major League Baseball as a rotation. The rotation has a losing record. <laughs> but because they're in all those tight games, their bullpen, much like last night, they'll keep it close and then they'll beat you late. Gone swinging his room. Second strike out of the inning. We take a peek ahead to Fox Saturday Baseball next week. Interleague play returns. And how about this matchup? The New York Yankees go to Wrigley Field. Our telecast of Fox Saturday Baseball presented by Sprint begins at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. Check local listings for the game and start time in your area. Where are you going next week? If anyway. I'm going, so I'm going to Atlanta. I got the Atlanta Braves, Texas Rangers, which that's a two good excellent matchup. ball club. Yep. Weak roller by Crawford. Phillips will throw him out. So Leak allows a hit. But that's all. End of two. Cincinnati one. San Francisco nothing. And we're back after a word from your local Fox station. By Sprint. All together now. Pitcher against pitcher to begin the Cincinnati third. The Reds with a one nothing lead. They got their only run off Tim Lincecum in the second inning. Run scoring single by Ryan Hannigan to score Jay Bruce. League not a bad hitter. Five out of 21. Of course, he played a lot of shortstop at Arizona State University and was a good offensive player. That's college. This is a big win. And that's Tim Lincecum. Very well put. Look at that. Now, that is a big <laughs> league setup right there. I understand that's how you're getting back down to Los Angeles a little bit later on this <laughs> afternoon. Leak pulls this one down the left field line in the corner. And that is a fair ball and a ground rule double. So it might be the big leagues. It might not be Arizona State. And he might be Tim Lincecum. But Leak apparently can still hit. Well, Drew Stubbs coming up. He's a Texas guy. Distinguished college career much like Lincecum. How about it, Chris Rhodes? Has won a pair of sides. The Golden Spikes Award, which was given to the nation's best player. That was back in 2006. 
Drew Stubbs was actually a finalist down at the University of Texas. Two other guys that were in the top five, Evan Longoria and David Price. So I'm thinking with that quartet of Lincecum and Stubbs, Price and Longoria, you, you could build a pretty good team. By the way, my ace researcher on that story, none other than Johnny Gomes of the Cincinnati wow. Reds who gave it up. How about that? Gomes, of course, grew up the road north of San Francisco up in Petaluma, California. Now, interesting decision here for Dusty Baker. Drew Stubbs is the Cincinnati leadoff batter. And even though he runs very well, a lot of people feel like he belongs in the middle of the order. But right now, they don't have anybody else that they want to lead off. Stubbs last night was asked to bunt in a critical situation in the ninth inning and did not look comfortable doing it at all. He does not have a sacrifice the entire year. Well, and, and that's why you don't bunt him. I mean, a lot of people will say, well, he's a big leaguer. He should know how to bunt. But the reality is Dusty feels he's got a better opportunity of getting that runner over, getting him in by swinging the bat. And that's what you have to recognize as a manager. You don't just go buy the book because the book says something. Well, he didn't have to take the bat off his shoulder. Lincecum walks him on four straight pitches. Now, if there is one guy they'll ask to put down a bunt and feel pretty comfortable about the chances, it's a man coming up now in Brandon Phillips. Yeah, and I don't think there's any question you've got to bunt right here. You know, Leak at second base, sometimes you might say, well, that's a pitcher out there running, but Mike Leak has pinched run at points during this season. Very capable athlete. Stubbs, very quick at first. I, I don't think there's any question. You bunt them over, you put runners on second and third, and then they choose to go away from Votto and pitch to Bruce with the bases loaded, so be it. But I would be surprised if Phillips does not bunt here. Phillips grounded out to the shortstop. Brandon Crawford, his first time up. Tejada even with a bag at third. Surprising to see Aubrey Huff where he is. He is playing behind the runner at first base. And Lincecum will get the out of third. Not a good bunt at all by Phillips. Right back to the mound. So one out in the inning. Well, you mentioned it. Aubrey Huff playing behind the runner at first base. Brandon Phillips can just push that ball towards the first baseman. Easily the runners advance. This one a high hopper right back to Tim Lincecum, who himself very athletic, gets off the mound, Gathers his feet and makes a good strong throw to Tejada at third, easily getting Mike Lee. One out in the inning, two on for Joey Votto. He flied out to left field his first time up. A little less than a week ago, Dusty Baker flip-flopped his lineup and put these two powerful left-handed batters back-to-back. -back. He was trying to separate them for most of the year by putting Scott Rowland or Johnny Gomes or somebody else in between Votto and Bruce and then made the decision. They're the two best hitters on the team. We're going to hit them back-to-back. -back. And there's a laser into center field to hit. Stubbs had to make sure that ball was going to Ball in front of the center fielder Rowan, and they are loaded. And Eric, you pretty much said it a minute ago. Had they put the bunt down, you pick your poison. Do you want to face Votto, or do you want to face a red hot Jay Bruce? Well, and Jay Bruce has been doing it. You mentioned player of the month for the month of May. You know, Joey Votto doesn't have the great home run numbers or RBI numbers. The reality is he hasn't been getting pitches to hit. It's indicated by that fourth. 64 on base percentage. A lot of walks. So now the Reds have them loaded with one out. Jay Bruce singled into center field an inning ago and scored the game's only run on a base hit by Ryan Hannigan. Well, the Reds failed so miserably in the game last night. It was one of the more difficult defeats in a season which has had a number of difficult defeats. Heck, last Saturday, they had a 7-2 lead going into the eighth inning over the Dodgers and got beat. 
But so many scoring chances where they failed to kick in the door. Well, it's been said, you, you never know what run out there is going to be that winning run. That's why when you have a chance to get them in, you've got to do it. Well, Bruce kicking himself after fouling that pitch away. One ball and two strikes. I mean, Eric, you know all the great years you had in the major leagues when you're facing guys like Lincecum. You're not getting too many good pitches to hit. No, if you get one, and if you get two, you're fortunate. You just can't afford to miss them. All right, Eric Harris, let's go inside the batter's box now. The base is loaded, one out. The count has gone to two balls and two strikes. Frequently we say this is the action pitch in this at bat. What it, are you looking for if you're Jay Bruce? I'm looking for location. I'm looking for something waist high or above. The reality, something down low is probably going to dart out of the zone. Like I said, dart out of the zone. <laughs> I don't know if I could have held up on that. And this is a great pitcher's pitch, but it's a good seven or eight inches out. But that's what Lincecum does. He entices you to expand your zone as a hitter. Got to make him get it up. Bouncing ball off the bag and a nice play by Huff to stay with it. That could have been a disaster. But the ground ball brings in Stubbs from third. Give Bruce his 48th run batted in, and the Reds have a 2-0 lead. Well, really a nice play by Aubrey Huff. He's going back. It hits right before the bag and just shoots right up. He stays with it. Tim Lincecum not breaking over to cover. Aubrey Huff hustles over. You mentioned that. That saved. That may be another two runs right there. That thing gets down the line. Now Roland, who fouled out to the third baseman, Tejada. Just one inning ago. And that one gets away from the catcher. Here comes the runner, Phillips, and the Reds will score again. Cincinnati now with a 3 0 lead. Phillips scores, and Otto on the third. Well, Lincecum's just been, he's been erratic. The, the control hasn't been there. He's been high. He's bounced a number of balls in the dirt. A couple have gotten by Whiteside. One and other rolling. And a fastball is up and in. Two balls and no strikes. And certainly this is not the Tim Lincecum that we have seen over the last three years in the big league. But it is the Tim Lincecum the Giant fans have seen over the last two starts. He's missed with location. He's fallen behind. He's thrown three more balls and he has strikes and a very high pitch count here in the third inning. And Roland lifts one in the air that'll be playable for Ross. This will end the inning. But the Reds get a couple of runs. A couple of hits leave a man and lead let's hit. Nothing lead against Tim Lincecum. It'll be Eli Whiteside, then the giant pitcher, back to the top of the order in Manny Burris. Lincecum not even in the all deck circle, having a long conversation with Dave Rigetti. Of course, Rigetti, at one time, an outstanding pitcher in his own right in the major leagues, both as a starter and a closer. Well, and the thing about you know speaking with Tim Lincecum there's so many moving parts there's, it, it's not very simple he, he's got an unconventional wind up you know he's basically taught himself his dad very instrumental in developing him as a pitcher and if you're Dave Rigetti you, you, you just got to go and try and say something that allows Tim Lincecum to have something click in his head say ah that's what it is let me go out and do something about it. 
Well, three and two on Eli Whiteside, just a 180 batter. With a home run and three runs batted in. Leak has not walked a batter today. He's only allowed one hit. Leak looking around, rolling, trying to find the ball, and you could tell right away he had no idea where it was. That'll be scored an infield hit on a routine pop-up. Well, you can tell Scotty Rowland has trouble. He's trying to go at the ball at an angle. The reason you go at it as a, at an angle is to try to get the sun out of your line of vision on the ball. Unable to do so, he loses the ball, and that is the most helpless feeling as a fielder when you don't even see the ball up in the sky. And now Linsen can ask to put down the butt. Leak throws, and they get the out at second base. Leak is extremely athletic. We brought it up earlier. Both of these pitchers, they're not real big guys, but they're very quick, they're very athletic, and they're very aggressive as defenders. Yeah, that's a very nice play by Leak. And as you mentioned, the word you use the word aggressive. I thought for sure he'd just go get the out at first, but made a nice strong throw to Yanish at second base, got the lead runner. So now Burrs for the second time. He flied out to Drew Stubbs in center field his first time up. Strike one. The ball at Stubbs a second time, and that's out number two. Well, the 16 greatest moments in Major League Baseball All Star history, what are they? Well, they're going head to head to determine which is the most memorable. Go to MLB.com slash moments and vote right now for your favorite midsummer classic. You can tune in, of course, to the 2000 Major League Baseball All Star game, Tuesday, July 12th, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. Right here on Fox to find out who won it. It's set up a lot like the NCAA basketball tournament. We've got the brackets of obviously the choices to make. And we'll give you a couple of those as this game rolls along. One on and two out in the giant third, and here's Tejada. Teata had two doubles and four at bats in the series opener. He had two more doubles, was on base four times last night. I mean, you're talking about a guy who had nine doubles the entire year, who's been impossible to walk the entire year. And he's had a monster couple of days, but that's his MO as we brought up earlier against Cincinnati. Right, and, and also there's something to be said about there being a sense of urgency. And what I mean by that is Sandoval close to becoming activated from the disabled list. You've got Brandon Crawford, the, the young shortstop who's had some recent success. And maybe something just kicks in. But he's been swinging the bat much better as of late. And that really has become, I'm not going to say the only pitch that he can hit, but that's become the only pitch that he can hit in the last two games of this series and it's made Dusty Baker live it that when they miss they continue to miss in on Tejada. They're setting up a way here and that's Jim right under the glove of Vada. Really been a sloppy defensive inning for one of the better defensive teams in the league. Well, I think Votto right there was was shaded a bit by Lincecum. Probably didn't pick the ball up off of the bat. You see, now watch where Tim Linscum is. He's right there in the line of vision. And again, I can tell you as an infielder, first of all, on day games, very difficult to pick up the ball out of the stands. That's number one because of the brightness. You mix in a base runner in front of you, just adds to the issue. 
Well, the routine pop up started the inning, allowing Whiteside to reach when Scott Rowland couldn't find the ball in the air. Aubrey Huff, a fly ball in the left center field. Lewis drifting and makes a catch. Wind blowing, really blowing to straightaway center field. Over across the Golden Gate, out to where Eric Caro stays when he comes into town. Alcatraz. As it's ball one to Freddie Lewis. It's a great place to visit, though. You got to take the kids out there. Sure is. Sometimes you might want to leave them out there. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis drew a walk his first time up. Reds have a three nothing lead over Lincecum. They got one run in the second. Scored twice more in the third. Left field has very much been a dark cloud for Cincinnati this year. Johnny Gomes, their primary left fielder a year ago, knocked in nearly 90 runs. And after a good couple of weeks to begin the year, it has been nearly a two month slump for Gomes, although on of the last six, seven games, starting to show signs of snapping out of it. There's ball four to Lewis. Second time he's walked in the game. We checked in with Dave Rigetti in between innings, the Giants pitching coach, and asked him his impression so far of his right hander, Tim Lincecum. Well, he certainly out of rhythm as soon as he got in a stretch and he's thinking about runners and he changed his body speed almost on every pitch, so he's, he's not comfortable right now and uh, a little bit out of sync, so we're going to work on that here in a minute. Rags, when he gets out of sync, mm -hmm. it, mechanically, what is the flaw? What do you tell him? Well, a lot of times with Timmy, I mean, he's a, obviously a big motion guy and a lot of rhythm. When he backs off sometimes and slows down too much, he actually throws himself off, and he's better off staying athletic and uh, keeping his delivery, you know, at a nice, smooth pace. And so he can sell his pitches and he can find his release point. But uh, when he's trying to speed up, when he's trying to slow down, you know, it makes it tough for him. It's, it's not one he's a lot of moving parts. So uh, there's, there's a lot of different things. But... To keep it uh, keep it simple, he really has to find a normal rhythm. David, thanks for the time. All right, guys. Well, we thank Dave Rigetti for his time as Ryan Hannigan pops up into shallow right field. One on, one out. And now Giannis, you bounced into a, a double play to end the second inning. The one thing you haven't heard a lot of talk about, and I mean, you can look at numbers. There goes Lewis, pitch is taken, and a throw down to second base. And boy, I tell you what, well, there came up the bag, and he's out. How about that? And staying with a play is Brandon Crawford, alertly so. Well, he slid off the bag. His momentum continued to carry him off, and you try to watch his left foot. Let's try and get back. Oh, Brandon Crawford kept the tag on Lewis's leg. Now, watch Lewis. He goes off. He's off the bag right now. I watch Crawford get him. Gets to him just before he's able to get his left foot back to the bag. Foul ground, first base side, and a nice play by a fan who brought his glove. You know, and that's one of the things about as a middle infielder or any infielder, always apply the tag. And there's nothing wrong with holding that tag on the runner. Even sometimes you give him a little nudge to get him off the base. Maybe the umpire gives you that call. But it doesn't do any good if you just swipe the tag and you're walking away looking cool and the guy's off the bag and then you give him a chance to get back on. It's a nice play by Brandon Crawford. Mm -hmm. There's a roller to the second baseman first and the inning is over. So a big break there for the Giants. Reds still lead it. 3 nothing. Sold out now their first 30 home games of the year. And you go back to last year, including the postseason, it's now 40 in a row. Well, this place was jumping last night. You know, Friday, the, the Giants on Friday night say wear those orange jerseys. 
and they encourage all the fans to wear orange. And it was very much an electric atmosphere last night, and they won in the bottom of the ninth inning. Cody Ross against Mike Leake to begin the inning, and that one is swung on and fouled out of play. Ross struck out looking his first time up. Leake has been very good. We talked about Lincecum. But the Reds have three runs against him. Mike Leake has allowed two hits, and one of them was a routine pop-up in the infield. Cody Ross gone swinging. Well, the team on a roll right now, the Boston Red Sox, a direct TV game break. Let's check in with Chris Rose. That's right, Tommy. They've won eight straight after dropping a beat down on the Blue Jays. Jason Veritek, his third of the year, and later on, it's Big Poppy. His 16th of the season, he's hitting 325. Red Sox won it 16 to 4 to see every baseball game the most in HD. It's 1 800 direct TV. And Guys, after that 2 and 10 start, they now co own the best record in baseball. It's been an amazing turnaround for Boston. And, uh, you know, we talked to some scouts earlier in the week. They were talking about David Ortiz. And now I know you've seen Boston a couple of times already this year. And, and scouts are saying he hasn't looked as good in four years. But well, the, the bat speed's definitely there. And I, I was just going to mention, remember, a year ago, a little over a year ago, people were talking about Big Poppy being done. and can't do it anymore and really I think the only person that believed that he could still play at a high level was himself he didn't let all the detractors deter from what he was trying to do and you know he's really been a big cog in that lineup this year oh and two on Shearholtz who had a broken bat single his first time up and boy leak is just picking him up and mowing him down four strikeouts now for him we invite you to help make a baseball moment that kids will never forget. Go to ChevyBaseball.com, support youth baseball, plus enter to win one of four trips to the 2011 Major League Baseball All-Star Game in Phoenix and the keys to a new Chevrolet. Strike one to Aaron Rowan. See, I, I think if you want to look at the two differences between these two pitchers today, Leak and Lincecum, Leak is just strike, 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 strike. He's not missing. He's working ahead of the hitters. You know, where Tim Lincecum today has just had to labor. Playing a little game right here. Aaron Rowan made Leak wait. Now Leak makes Aaron Rowan wait. Well, Leak now strike away from fanning the side here in the bottom of the fourth inning. You may remember Leak. We told you he made the jump from college to the major leagues. And he was a talk of a National League the first two months of last year. But the Reds knew all along. That he would be limited to a certain number of innings. And it didn't matter if the Reds were 10 games in front. It didn't matter if they were 30 games back. They were going to shut him down. And Leak will tell you that while he appreciates that, he is convinced the reason his season went south is because all of a sudden, after pitching every five days in the rotation to begin the year, they'd skip him a turn, they'd push him back four or five days. He'd wait 10 days to start another game. And the wheels did fall off from a numerical standpoint. Well, all players, offensive, defensive, pitchers, are creatures of habit. You get into a routine. And then when you're thrust out of that routine, well, you have to try to figure out how to get yourself at that level to perform. And sometimes you just you can't find that rhythm. You can't get into that comfort zone. You can't get into that routine. 3-2 pitch. Broken back, base hit. 
All three Giants hits today. Two of them are broken bats, and the other one's a pop-up. Rowan just shoots the ball out to right. As you mentioned, doesn't hit it hard. And that just is indicative of, of what type of stuff Leak has today. He's avoiding the barrel. The, the, there's been some swings and misses. Got Cody Ross, the bat went flying. And there have not been good, healthy swings against Leak today. Brandon Crawford, first pitch swinging, a fly ball to left. And that will do it in the Giant fourth. We move to the fifth, where Mike Leak and the Reds lead the Giants 3-0. A little bit different choice in regard to transportation from what we saw a little bit earlier. The Frida B. That B real nice. <laughs> Looks like they're having some fun out there. Well, Mike Leak helped start that two run. Reds third inning off Lensicum with a double down the left field line. Three runs, four hits for the Reds. No runs, three hits for the Giants. And Leak a hot smash off the glove of a diving burst. And Leak will slam on the brakes after a big turn. He's two for two. As you mentioned, Leak treating this like this is college ball again. Had two base hits already against Tim Lincecum. Ball just shoots off of Burris's glove. Sherold's doing a nice job of hustling over there because Leak, I think, initially thought maybe he could get the second. But then he remembered he's not at Arizona State. <laughs> <laughs> All right now, Drew Stubbs. He has struck out and drawn a walk and scored a run. I don't know what the numbers say from. A historical standpoint, but we were talking with Dusty Baker before the game today. And Eric, tell me if you agree with this or not. But but certainly Dusty Baker felt like you'd be hard pressed to find somebody else who's done this. Stubbs for most of this year has led the National League in runs scored, and he has led the National League in strikeouts. That means when he's hitting the ball, he's getting on. It's one of those statistics where it's the balls put in play. Mm -hmm. That tells me that when he does make contact, he's hitting the ball hard. You know, the problem is those 80 some odd strikeouts that he brings with him into today's ball game. Well, Lincecum is pitching him like he's the most dangerous hitter on the planet. He's walked him twice in a row. Time now for a direct TV game break. Let's go to Chris Rose. A time like the San Francisco Giants, the Philadelphia Phillies offense has been scuffling a bit lately, but Chase Utley, his return should help. This a two-run double as Jimmy Rollins and Shane Victorino score. That gives Cliff Lee a 2-0 lead over the Cubs. Remember to see every baseball game the most in HD. It's 1-800-DIRECT-TV. Guys? All right, Chris, thank you very much. Second time we've had this situation. The last time they had Phillips bunt. He could not advance a runner successfully. Do you have him do it again? He's bunting again. Absolutely for me. Exactly. <laughs> that ball is drilled in the left field, and this is up against the wall. Leak will score. They're going to wave around Stubbs. He will score on a two-run double by Phillips, and the Reds are laying it on Lincecum here today. A 5 nothing game. Well, that's why Dusty's won a few Manager of the Year awards, and I'm sitting up here. I would have had him button right there, but a little different. You're up three to nothing. Dusty playing for the big inning. Especially with the way Mike Leak is pitching. Brandon Phillips drives this ball. Look at that. Just rotates. Doesn't drift forward. Stays behind the ball. That's just a nice job. A long visit to the mound by Dave Brigetti and the home plate umpire Jeff Nelson going to come break it up. The Giants have action in their bullpen. Right hander Guillermo Mota begins to throw. Well, now
now you're down five nothing a runner at second base and nobody out and you have Votto and Bruce coming up. Well I think the bigger concern is you're down five nothing in your offense. Doesn't put up five runs very often. Of course this inning again gets started with a base hit by the pitcher. Leak already with two hits today. Lincecum had given up just two hits to opposing pitchers all year. Balls in a year, well hit, deep left field. Ross gets turned around. This will be an RBI double by Votto. And the day may just about be over for Tim Lincecum. He is getting tattooed here today. It is a 6 nothing game. Bruce Bochy coming out of the dugout and uh, they're going to continue to ask the question. You go back to the 133 pitch game and Tim Lincecum has not been the same guy. We'll hear Eric Caro's thoughts on that topic when we return. You know there's going to be a lot of talk. His last two starts weren't up to par as well. And now this is a third and this is probably the worst of the three. But remember, Tim Lincecum went through a stretch last year in August where people were wondering, what's going on? How's he throwing? What's happening? 0 and 5, 7 8 2 ERA. And then what did he do in September in the postseason? Mm -hmm. Dominated. So Guillermo Mota takes over on the mound. Giants have made three total changes as part of this double switch. The roller by Jay Bruce. And that's an out the first one in the inning with Votto advancing on the third. Let's take a look at our Jeep game summary. And Leak has been the one who's been on top of his game so far today. Yeah, both offensively and out on the mound. You see the four innings pitch, four strikeouts. The most important thing, though, no walks. And of the three hits, nothing, nothing really hit hard today. Offensively, two base hits. There's the newest addition of the Giants, Bill Hall. Going to get some. He's going to get some opportunities. When Freddy Sanchez went down with that injury last night. Brian Sabian did not waste any time at all. He becomes a 35th different player used by the Giants so far this year. Hall played in 46 games with the Astros, only a 2.24 batter. He signed there in the offseason as a free agent thinking he would be an everyday player again after being a guy who played all over the place with Boston last year. Of course, Brian Sabian been around here a long time and certainly the crown jewel season for him last year when the Giants won it all. Infield in. And rolling a fly ball in the left center field that'll bring in another run. Seven nothing Cincinnati and all seven runs charged to Lincecum. There's a transaction after the injury last night to the right shoulder of Sanchez. Billy Hall brought in today. <laughs> All one to Fred Lewis who has walked twice. Lots of reasons to smile so far today for Brandon Phillips and the Reds. Boy, there weren't any smiles after that loss here last night. And you know, when you have a lead like today, and there's a long way to go, but you really kick yourself after losing that one last night because you come in here, tough place to play. Johnny Cueto shuts out the Giants here on Thursday night. You feel like you should have put them away when you had the chance time after time last night. And now you're thinking you just knocked Lincecum out of the game in the fifth inning today. 
Yeah, he could easily be up 3-0 looking into the fourth game on Sunday. Yeah, but the Reds, they've had some tough ones over the last two weeks. And we talked about that game last Saturday here on Fox. They had the lead against the Dodgers late in the ball game and gave it up. That 19 any affair a couple weeks ago against the Phillies, they had opportunities to win that ball game and weren't able to take advantage of it. You know, and those are the games at the end of the year. If you if you don't win the division or you miss the playoffs by two or three or four games, you go, God, you remember that game back in June or that game back in May? Do fans do that or do players also do that? Well, I, I think fans forget about the games. They're, they're a bit more current, but as a player, you remember everything over the course of the season. You know, you look back at, you know, an at-bat you had in April that could have changed the game, and you just say, man, if I can't believe that I let that thing get away like that. But I do. I, I believe players look back on it, and missed opportunities they're much more aware of than, than fans. Ryan Hannigan, the eighth man to bat in what has been a four-run Reds' fifth inning. Hannigan knocked in the first run of the game with a single back in the second. Guillermo Moda has been around seemingly forever. Of course, he has a very close relationship with your longtime teammate, very <laughs> yeah, good I friend, Mike Piazza. <laughs> I sent some sarcasm there. <laughs> yeah, Mike went to visit him uh, in the locker room. When Guillermo was with the Dodgers, Mike was with the Mets. Guillermo had, had thrown at him, and Mike didn't take too kindly to it. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there like to know how Mike Piazza is doing these days. Well, he's living down in Florida. He's in the process of writing a book. He's got uh, families taken care of. He's doing well, enjoying the retired life. Good for him. I think he's on the ballot next year. Hall of Fame. Go down as one of the greatest hitting catchers to. I'd argue probably the greatest hitting catcher to, to ever play the game. Oh, well, the numbers would back that up from yeah. a straight offensive standpoint. No doubt about that. Of course, you get into all-around catchers of the game, and and then there's some people say, you know, guys like Johnny Bench, and you know, others will talk about, you know, Yogi Berra. I mean, going way, way back, and drop a bill, times, drop a Bill Dickey on me too. Bill Dickey, <laughs> but, and if I'm Rodriguez has to be in that category. Yeah, yep. Three and one on Hannigan. It's been a frustrating day for Bruce Bochy. We could hear it in Bochy's voice during the press conference after the game here on Thursday night. When the Reds shut out the Giants 3-0, there goes a runner. And it's taken inside ball four. And the lack of offense is really starting to wear Bochi down a little bit. I mean, he made it a point over and over again to say, hey, look, Johnny Cueto is one of the best young pitchers in the game today. He threw the ball beautifully, but. Well, you know, we talk about some of the injuries that the Giants have had to suffer through. And we're not talking about utility guys. We're talking about core guys, mm -hmm. core offensive players. And whether it's Sandoval or, no, or now Sanchez, who was leading the team in hitting. You know, Cody Ross being out at the beginning of the year. Mark DeRosa, a utility guy who I thought was going to have a huge impact on this ball club this year. One down the right field line and able to track it as Sheerholtz. We'll get back to those thoughts. When the Giants back in the fifth, Red send nine to the plate and score four times in the inning. At North, San Francisco, and across the Golden Gate Bridge.
Well, well, some of the most spectacular scenery in the greatest country of all the world. They saw Salido off to the right over there. You can peel off to the left, hit Mount Tam, go down the other side to Stinson Beach. All the way up to Point Reyes and beyond. Beautiful. You made that trip with the wife once in a while, or? I made it with a wife, and I made it for the first time as a very young man. <laughs> Didn't know a soul. I was just driving around mindlessly. Eli Whiteside to lead it off, and a fly ball in the right field. One out. Of course, they come from all over the world to make that trip. All right now, Bill Hall will come up to the plate. Second baseman, First time as a batter for the, the San Giants. Francisco Welcome Giants. Number 29, Bill Hall. Bill Hall's had a nice career. Had a lot of very good years in Milwaukee. He's athletic. You know, can fill a number of spots for this Giants ball club. But the reality is they're looking for some offense. You know, that, that 220 that he was sporting over in Houston, you know, they hoped that he left that in Houston. Left that in Arizona as he was waiting around for a phone call. He's a much better hitter than that. You know, if you're the Giants, it, it's really a no-risk deal. You, you bring him over, you, you, you're paying the minimum at a prorated amount. And you just hope that you get some of those moves that you made last year, whether it was Pat Burrell coming over and igniting this offense, or as you mentioned, Cody Ross. You hope you catch that with Bill Hall. Bill well, Hall draws a walk. That's the first one given up by Mike Leake here today. I want to get back for a minute because I asked you about it as we were going to break. Linsica. 133 pitches. Four starts ago against the A's. His very next game, pretty good start against a very good hitting Milwaukee team. But now three in a row, very poor starts for Linsica. Are you concerned? Well, if I've got to find out and I've got to ask him, wow, that's a nice play by Votto. Good clean slide, hard slide by Hall. May have forced that Aaron throw from Giannis. Shall they get the lead runner? One out. Well, you, you know, let's look at this replay real quick here. Votto gets the ball, does a nice job of making a good throw to the shortstop. I see Bill Hall right on top. Giannis had time right there. But what's difficult is you're trying to hit, as a shortstop, you're trying to hit a moving target in the pitcher running over to first base. See that throw behind Mike Lee. But getting back to, to Lincecum, you know, I've got to go to to him and say, look, physically, are you okay? Do you feel right? Because if you feel right, then I know it's a mechanical thing. We go from there. We can look at tape. We can go down to the bullpen. We can mess around with that. But Tim Lincecum has to be honest. If he's saying, hey, look, I feel a little fatigued, skip a start. You know, push him back. It's no big deal. You're not winning anything in July or June, but you could lose something in June. You keep running him out there where he's not 100%. The confidence starts to go down. Maybe he hurts himself. You just, I've got to get an honest answer from Tim Lindsay. And then I go from there. One on, two out. Giants batting in the bottom of the fifth. And the Reds with a 7 nothing lead. Tejada has grounded out to second and reached on an air by Joey Votto. You know, and just one more thing to get back. Remember, he went through this in August last year. You know, the guy is entitled to be human. You know, I think we always get into these situations where guys are dominant they're at the top of the game they're the best player so we expect that every single time well you know what some days you're just not going to have it just like every one of us getting out of bed some days you just ain't feeling it mm -hmm. 
Back to Leak. So in the inning, only five batters over the minimum as Mike Leak through the front five innings. And his team has put seven runs on the board. Sellout crowd, beautiful Saturday in San Francisco. And a good day for the Reds, a team that came here last year and was completely humiliated in a three-game series in August. In fact, when the Reds came here last year, their pitching staff gave up 38 runs, 53 hits in a three-game series. And to give you an idea of how rare that is, even for a franchise like the Giants in the past with so many great sluggers, it was the first time since the Giants had moved to California where they had scored that many runs over a three-game series. Well, as you mentioned, doing it in a ballpark like this as well, which is not hitter conducive. That's just one of those stretches where one team is hot. Talking about hot, this man up at the plate. Two leadoff base hits. It led to a two-run inning and then a four-run inning. It's been dominant on the mound. Of course, back in the third inning, he was up there and whacked a double down the left field line off Lincecum. And then a single in the right, which started that four-run rally, Eric, you mentioned in the fifth. You know, but the, the key in both, the, a two-run and a four-run inning, and both times he led off the inning. And I'll tell you what, Tim Lincecum against a pitcher leading off an inning, it's usually one out with the leadoff hitter coming to the plate. You know, both huge at-bats. And at the time, you don't think anything of it. Well, they're finally going to get him out on a pop up to Huff. One away. It's time for a direct TV game break. And let's check in with Chris Rhodes. Guys, all twins against the Rangers this afternoon. Paul Revere was on his horse. Ben Revere is on his as well. And I'll take that. Thank you. Scott Baker dominant this afternoon. He strikes out the reading AL MVP Josh Hamilton. A one hitter into the six. It's seven nothing twins. Back it up with Tom and EK. All righty, Chris. Well, Chris, what in the world, by the way, is going on with your Cleveland Indians? Reality. I'll tell you, reality. That's what's going on. I wish this were a closer game so we could focus on that instead of <laughs> instead of the Indians fall from grace. Uh, yeah, Mitch Talbot, as you saw in the pregame, was thrown out of the game today for hitting A-Rod after the near fisticuffs between Girardi and Acta last night. That one... Smoked up the third base line by Stubbs. A fan will touch it, and that'll be a ground rule double. And really, that's a break for the Giants because Stubbs, if that ball ricochets out towards left, he's standing at third. As Stubbs just hooks this ball inside the line, you can see it hits and it's heading right towards the wall. Not necessarily the, the left field wall, but that foul wall. Brandon Phillips with runners at first and second and nobody out in the fifth inning. Line to double off the left field wall scoring two. He later scored himself. He has a pair of runs scored in the game today. He's uh, wearing a microphone for us today. Generally every single time we have the Reds on Fox Saturday baseball. We gave him a break last Saturday. Because he provides us unquestionably of, of some of the best Fox sounds of the game. Among all players in either league. But he has a microphone on today and going to bring you some of his comments a moment ago when he saw his his buddy Bill Hall show up. Reds have already played the Astros. 
nearly 10 times so far this year. So he's seen plenty of one another. These two guys have so far this year. But the first time today since Hall was brought in late last night to play for the Giants. Two and two. You know, this is where Moda's job is just to eat up innings, just to give that bullpen a break. We'll save the guys where they need to be used tomorrow. Bruce Bochy can get there. Top three hitters in this Reds lineup have done major damage here today. They've scored five runs. They have four hits and eight at bats. They've drawn two walks. We talked about it before the game got started. I mean, this is certainly something that Cincinnati does to people on more than just an occasional basis. If they can figure out a way to start getting more production offensively from left field, and really third base, I mean, Roland's been quite quiet from a production standpoint ever since he re-injured his shoulder early in the year. Well, there's no question there's room for improvement in the Cincinnati offense. And that's, that's tough to, to, to say when you, you've got arguably the, the second-best offense behind the Cardinals in, in the National League. But they can get better. But I, I think if I'm Dusty Baker, though, right now, where, where I'm excited... Johnny Cueto is throwing the ball well. Volquez threw the ball well the other day. You know, Mike Leak looking like he's going to have his fourth quality start in his last four outings. You know, and you still, you've got Chapman down in the minor league still working on things. Didn't have a very good outing the other day, but Homer Bailey going out on a rehab mm -hmm. assignment soon. And you're in a stretch right now where if you can just get to that all-star break and you know be in the thick of things I mean the second half of the schedule really favors the Reds like they're in a stretch right now with 16 of, of 31 games where they were playing teams that were or are in first place mm -hmm. up until the all-star break 26 of the 31 games against teams that are 500 or above you know and that was starting on Thursday so We've got a lot ahead of him. Two and two on Phillips. One at second and one out in the inning. And found out to play again. They're also four days away from ending a stretch where they play 33 games in 34 days, including inside of that 20 days in a row that included four extra inning games, one being a 19 inning game. And some of those games, you know, the, those extra inning games were losses. They've had some very tough losses, you know, excluding those extra inning ball games. And that can get demoralizing. You know, they had that two and eight road trip. The one thing I'll say about a Dusty Baker led ball club, he's not going to let you get down. He's as good as there is in having a positive clubhouse, keeping the guys upbeat, you know, looking at things. In a broader perspective, not getting too fired up or too low and things aren't going well. Tenth pitch of this at bat coming up. One on, one out. Two balls, two strikes on Brandon Phillips. And Moda to the plate. 
And he'll finally take care of Phillips. And we finally get to our Fox sounds of the game with a red second baseman a short while ago. Yes, he be a hall over there, man. What are you doing over there? That boy was, that boy was at the house. Yeah, he was. Too. He was at the house chilling. He looked good in that cream, though. He looked all right. Hey, I, I looked over there. I said, "Who that pretty boy Floyd doing over there, man?" I'm like, "Come on now." I'm just glad he got rid of that mohawk. That's what I'm happy for. <laughs> well, he's talking about being back at the house. He was in Arizona, waiting for a phone call. Brian Sabian made that phone call, and here he is. You go from laying on the couch to being in a big league game all this span of 24 hours. Not bad. It's a good gig. Well, now Joey Votto with Drew Stubbs at second and two outs here in the red sixth inning. Strike one to Votto. Votto, Canadian born and raised, grew up. Outside of Toronto. A highly touted prospect ever since the day they signed him. Has always put up big numbers in the minor leagues. Got that chance to be called up three years ago. He knocked the cover off the ball, but unbeknownst to nearly everyone, Vado's father passed away late in that year. He was very close to his dad. As a mom and a couple of brothers who still live up in the Toronto area. And Vado fell into a severe state of depression during the offseason. Came back the following year, still didn't tell anybody about it. Wound up going on the disabled list, and ever since then, I mean, he has been among the elite players and elite batters in all the baseball. He's a very intense, focused young player. Right, I think you hit it right on the head when you talk about top players in baseball. I mean, you're talking about maybe the top five or six. He's got to be on that list. We're not talking about just a slugger. We're talking about complete makeup. As a hitter, power, average, defensively, what he does in the clubhouse, how he approaches the game. It's as good as you're going to get. Not really sure what we're featuring there. We're working on something. Like a spring training play. Oh, and two on Votto. Off the body of Moda, and this will be an infield hit. So a three hit game for Votto in just six innings today. Well this July. We certainly expect to see Joey Votto. In the Arizona desert. The summer's biggest event. This Fox brings you every thrilling moment of the 2011 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. Coverage begins Tuesday July the 12th. At 8 Eastern 5 Pacific only on Fox. You told me you'll be there Eric Carroll's. What do you think? Roof closed or open there? Closed. It's got to be closed, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Too bad, too, because when that roof is open in that ballpark, I think it's one of the most spectacular venues in all the baseball. No, I, I, I agree. But I'd much rather be at about 80 degrees rather than 110. <laughs> I don't care how nice something looks. Boy, you Southern California guys. <laughs> Strike one at Jay Bruce. Well, certainly those Diamondbacks have been among the the big surprises so far among all National League teams this year. They lost nearly a hundred games a year ago. And there's Skipper in his first full year since taking over last summer. Kirk Gibson has him four games over 500, two behind these Giants. Well, no question, a attitude change, and then President Derek Hall hiring. Former GM of the Padres, Kevin Towers, come over and put his stamp on the ball club. That's the thing that that National League West is, you know, it, it's really 
it's wide open, and I'm not so sure that if there's any team that just sets itself apart from any other team. I, I mean, for me, it's the Giants right now just because of their pitching staff, but you know, you, any of these teams that get hot over there, they can make a case for themselves. On the ground is short, and they'll have to play to first, and that's where they get the final out of the inning. Middle of the sixth, all Cincinnati so far. Giants coming to bat bottom half for the sixth inning. Red scored one in the second. They scored two in the third and a four run fifth to knock out Tim Lincecum. And meanwhile, give credit where credit is due. You know, Mike Leak, for whatever reason, when he starts games for the Reds this year, they score a pile of runs for him. And then you look at a guy like Madison Bumgarner. He got shut out of here three nothing by Johnny Cueto in the Reds bullpen on Thursday night. He only allowed one run in seven innings. It was a fourth time this year. He allows one run or less. And they're averaging barely over a run per game with Bumgarner on the mound. Yeah, it happens. You know, the staff that gets an inordinate amount of run support or another guy that pitches great but can't score for him. Just hope you're not that guy that they can't score for. Well, that wind is continuing to blow quite hard. There's a pop up to Votto, one out. Well, Fox Sports proud to support Stand Up to Cancer and the work they're doing to fund groundbreaking research that helps accelerate treatment to patients. Stand up for someone you love. Visit Stand Up, the number two cancer.org slash Fox Sports to learn more. Well, Eric Carroll, we came in and it goes to show you. I mean, baseball never fails to go against the grain. What you think might happen rarely ever does. Well, you know, we, we talked about the offense and we, we talked about the Reds. Joey Votto, he, he's done his job. But we also talked about Tim Lincecum and, and the dominance that, that he's had over the course of his career. He just didn't have it. It's a third start now that, uh, you know, he hasn't pitched like Tim Lincecum. And there's got to be some concern with the Giants. No, but again, I, 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 I take Tim Lincecum every single day of the week, and I chalk this up as more of a, a stretch where just things aren't going well. He's not feeling it. He's not pitching well, just as he did in August of last year where he really struggled. He's 0-5. You know, he turned it around and was as good as it was in the big leagues for the last month and for the playoffs. That's the hardest hit ball through this entire game by a Giant today. That one laced into left field, a one out double by Cody Ross. It's a fastball that's meant to be on the outer half of the plate. You watch Hannigan, the catcher's glove, just kind of move towards the inner half. Cody Ross does a nice job of driving it down the left field corner. Well, the guy starting to swing the bat a little bit better here over the last couple of weeks. Well, you know, you get to this Giants ball club. We mentioned, you know, the sand of all being out, the posy being gone. For me, the big key, especially as compared to last year, is Aubrey Huff. You know, Aubrey Huff last year, going up until the beginning of August, he was my National League MVP. He had 20 home runs, 65 RBI. I mean, he just looked great. Struggled the last two months. Didn't, wasn't on the same pace. And, and then just this this year, you know, coming into the game, the 285 on base percentage, slugging of 380. I mean, they've got to get more production from him. And I believe he's the key to this giant offense. You know, the one number that, you know, when you're looking at Huff and you're saying, okay, and sooner or later he's going to get it together. And, and he has a good track record. He's never been a great offensive player. He's been a very good offensive player. But the one number that has to, to scare the daylights out of you is his inability to hit right-handed pitching. 
you know, as a left-hander, you don't see many left-handers. And so you'll occasionally struggle against those guys. He has the lowest batting average in Major League Baseball as a left-handed batter versus right-handed pitching. Well, and again, that's that's this year. And, and I think that this year right now, nothing has gone right. It's become mental. He's trying to live up to the... I believe the two-year deal that he signed. He's trying to live up to, you know, being the guy last year. That's that fastball that starts at your hip and then comes back to catch the edge of the plate. And very tough as a left-handed hitter. Now, this is up in the zone a little bit. Runs back over the plate. Difficult pitch to get to if you're a left-handed hitter. You know, but getting back to Aubrey Huff, I, I think when Sandoval comes back, he'll get some time at first base. Aubrey Huff has just been run out there every single day, too. And he's had to play a multitude of positions. Bruce Bochy said, look, I, I've got to give him a breather now. And then. Many were hoping that Sandoval would be coming off the disabled list when Cincinnati came to town. You know, they wrote about it quite a bit in the local papers that, you know, you're finally playing a club coming into your ballpark obviously against a great pitching staff but a team that is more than capable of scoring some runs and the Giants would need all the offense they could muster against this Reds team and and after Sandoval had some soreness in the wrist and the forearm area sat out a game earlier in the week they decided to wait until the team went to Arizona to begin a series at the start of next week well again you're looking at it you know for the long haul and it's much better to err on the side of caution bring him back you know a week later than that you had originally anticipated you know I mean whatever the Giants do in this series against the Reds is not going to determine their fate in the National League West because they're atop the division because we aren't in September give Sandoval a bit more time well, I mean, here's a formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know about the batting average. Look at the runs per game. Only one team has scored fewer runs per game than the Giants. They don't hit home runs. They've hit 11 home runs at home all year. They don't steal bases, but what they do is pitch. And they win late, especially here. As Rowan has now hit on a pitch up and in. Looks like it got him on a hand. Hopefully he's going to be all right. Well, they're looking to go inside, and this ball just continues to run in. Aaron Rowan unable to get out of the way. That's, you know, the right wrist. And there's a lot of bone in that area. And as a hitter, that's your biggest fear. You'd much rather take one off the ribs or the leg or the gluteus maximus, but you don't want one off the wrist. You don't want one off the wrist, off the hand. Awful sore, awful, awful susceptible to, you know, some small bone break. Remember, that's what grips the bat. Well, now Burl to bat for Moda. Pat Burl signing a one-year deal to stay right here in San Francisco. After coming over and giving them some big, big moments a year ago. Well, he came over and provided some power. He provided leadership in the clubhouse. You know, Bruce Bochy sends him up here hoping he'll run into one and make this a 7-4, seven, 7-3 seven, ball game. Two on, two out. One ball and one strike on the pinch hitter, Pat Burrow. That's taken up and away.
Break even pitch to Burrow. Struck him out, inning over. We go to the sixth. Red seven, Giants nothing. We're back after a word from your local Fox station. Reds come to bat here in the top half of the seventh inning. Leading 7 0, and the Giants will bring on their third pitcher of the afternoon. It's Ramon Ramirez. Ball one to Scott Rowland. Rolling 0 for 2 at a sack fly run batted in in the four run fifth inning. What well, is giant bullpen? Well, we've talked about their starters quite a bit. But on the rare day where their starter may have an off day, more accurately and more frequently, where the starter will pitch well, but the offense doesn't give up in terms of help. When Bruce Bochy rings that bullpen, I mean, those guys are there to get the job done. Right. Well, well, they all have roles, but they're all very effective in their specific role. You know, and I, I think that the way Bruce Bochy and Dave Rigetti have handled that bullpen, you know, how Brian Sabian has assembled that bullpen, you know, that really separated them last year from a lot of the other ball clubs. And the starters would get you a strong six or seven, and then you go to the bullpen, it was all over with. And there was no messing around. If you didn't have a lead, you were in trouble. You really go back and look at the way the West was won last year. Turned out to be a two team race. When, when all was said and done, it was San Diego or the Giants. San Diego statistically had the best bullpen in Major League Baseball last year. The difference was when they got to September. Some of the big time starters for San Diego, guys like Matt Latos and some others who were in a big league season for the first time, a full big league season, they tapered off where the Giants guys really stepped up in the rotation. Well, the, the Giant guys stepped up, and, and I'll, I'll say that. I mean, that September stretch last year that the Giants had as far as pitching was really on parallel until you watch what they did in the postseason. You know, they, they just absolutely dominated. And, and the Padres, on the other hand, that September stretch they had, the teams they had to play against, not only in the Western Division, but they had out-of-division games against the Reds, against the Cardinals. I mean, they were playing teams that were competing for the their own division titles, and the Padres just got beat up. They went through the ringer and came out on the short end. Well, Aaron Rowan had to leave the game, of course, uh, after getting hit on what looked like the right wrist during that at bat in the sixth inning. That just tails in, and that gets all wrist. And that's the right wrist. As I said, as a hitter, that's the last place you want to get hit. You'll take one in the side, in the ribs, in the leg, in the back. But anytime you injure your hands and you're a hitter, not fun. I don't know what it is. It seems like there are so many teams in Major League Baseball that have been so frequently injured. I mean, we saw the Dodgers last week. They've had their projected starting infield not even start four games together this year. You know, this Reds team, they use 19 different pitchers over a 17 day stretch. Well, I, I think, you know, nowadays, I teams are more protective of their players you know they're looking at it in the long run as far as look if I've got somebody whether it's a, a pitcher that may not be doing well or feeling right then maybe I'll get him to the DL well, you take a look at the Giants and of course uh, you go back season got started this year at the end of March 
First, it was Barry Zito with a foot injury. Pablo Sandoval, we know about the broken handmade bone that required surgery. Mark DeRosa, you talked about him. Mike Fondo is your starting shortstop. Buster Posey with a broken ankle and torn ankle ligaments. Brandon Feld, highly touted young player in their farm system. And last night you throw in Freddy Sanchez. We'll see about Aaron Rowan here today. And yet they're still atop the division. And the reason they're still atop the division, take a look at what happened to Freddy Sanchez last night, second baseman. It looks unassuming there. It doesn't look like he rolled anything, but a dislocated right shoulder. You can see the way he's wincing in pain. But as I was getting back, they're atop the division because of all of those injuries. You didn't see Matt Kane. You didn't see Tim Lincecum. You didn't see Baumgartner, Wilson, Sanchez. Vogelsong stepped on and done it great. The pitching staff has basically remained intact. You see they've got the two game lead in spite of all those injuries. Look at the other teams in the division as well. They've they've also suffered. Well Colorado they've had Aaron Cook down. They have Jorge De La Rosa's down. Well De La Rosa was the big one. Yep. I mean, that, that, that's their number one guy. I mean you know Jimenez maybe but and he's gone for the year. Talked about the Dodgers and all the injuries they have had. Arizona's a team, by and large, that has stayed healthy. Of the guys they were counting on to be a big part of their team and, and trying to get off the mat from 2010. Low and two to Hannigan. Ramirez looking for a perfect inning. And that's the one thing I will say whether it's about the West or the or the Central Division in the National League you can make a case for a number of teams nobody's run away with anything you know a lot of baseball still to be played all the ball clubs have their flaws I mean as a fan that makes it much more interesting for me you know, I'm watching I'm Seeing where teams can go, what maybe acquisitions they can make, see what happens when guys get healthy. Much better than watching somebody run away with it. One and two on Hannigan. And another foul ball out of play. It's a big league play right there. We've seen a couple of them today. We've seen a couple of bad boots here today. Norm Lee's is a very good fielding crowd <laughs> here in San Francisco. They really are. A lot of them bring their gloves. We've seen a couple of nice plays today, and I mean, we've seen as ugly as it gets. Two and two again on Hannigan. And it's ball three. Paul Yanish on deck. Reds shortstop. Ninth pitch in his at bat. And it ends in a single. That's quite an at bat. Been a good day for Hannigan. Two hits, knocked in a run, been on base three times. He had two hits in an RBI in a game here last night. You know, that is one area of the Reds that is so frequently overlooked. The only team among all National League clubs last year that got more RBIs out of their catching position was Atlanta. I mean, the duo of Ramon Hernandez and Ryan Hannigan. Had an outstanding year offensively last year, and for the Reds, many publications believe they have not only one, 
but the best two catching prospects among all teams in minor league baseball, major league baseball. You have Devin Mezzarocco, a number one pick, high school kid out of Pennsylvania, who is their triple A catcher coming off a monster year last year and doing it again this year. And then their number one pick just from last year out of the University of Miami, Yasmani Grandal is their catcher at the double-A level having a big year. You can never have enough depth at the catching position. You see what's going on with the Giants. The loss of Posey. This should be the final out. But you saw right there, much like what happened to Scott Rowland, it appeared as though Aubrey Huff never saw that ball. And you see Huff was looking up Whiteside going after it. He's trying to battle the sun. Where he is. Relative to the dugout. You see no Reds players are going to be up there helping him or directing him. Low and two on Giannis. Straight away center field, and that will continue to soar and go all the way to the wall. We talked about the wind earlier, and if this is your home ballpark, you got to know it a little bit better than that. And Cody Ross was clearly fooled. It is eight nothing Reds. Of course, maybe he never saw the ball. Well, you see, his first step or two is in. And when he realizes that the ball is going to be over his head, doesn't have a play, and in his defense, he doesn't play a lot of center field. Aaron Rowan, Andres Torres has the day off today. Not an easy outfield to play in this ballpark. Sun and wind. Well, you were one of those guys that played in the old ballpark. 6.2 miles down the road. Not a lot of fun. And... You could look at the flags and even you know I talked to the guys here and the flags could be blowing one way but down on the field the winds blowing or swirling a different way and each inning you've got to be cognizant of where that wind is blowing how it's blowing you've got to pay attention to that or you can get yourself into trouble as a fielder. One and two on Mike Leak. Inning over. Another run, a couple of more hits. They stand and stretch, and the Reds stretch their lead to eight. to San Francisco where the Reds are looking to make it two wins in the first three games of this series they have one more here tomorrow night that'll be a late afternoon start time Pacific time five o'clock eight o'clock Eastern Mike Leak on the mound and Eli Whiteside pops it up Votto battling the sun and the wind one out well, now it's time for the Just for Men Keep Your Edge spotlight, just as Mike Lee gives the Reds the edge. You two can keep your edge with Just for Men mustache and beard. Lee has done it on the mound and swinging the bat. It really has been the two way player today. Remember, this is coming off a start where he eight innings pitched, only two runs, one walk. You know, Dusty Baker, like I said, you know, he's probably happy with where they are offensively and what they've done, but he's got to be ecstatic with the way Mike Leake has thrown since his recall from the minor leagues. Well, you know, you, you go back to spring training, and the one thing that most people said about the Reds outside of their big offense was that they might have had more pitching depth 
than any organization in Major League Baseball. Well, as spring training moved along, and it is such a young starting rotation, before you know it, Homer Bailey hurt. Johnny Cueto hurt. I mean, it's probably safe to say a guy like Mike Leake was not going to be in the Reds starting rotation had everybody stayed healthy. But the Reds play the first month of the season without 40% of their rotation. Their opening day starter, Edinson Volquez, had a hard time getting anybody out for the better part of a month. They sent him all the way down to the minor leagues. Meanwhile, Bronson Arroyo, when the team leaves spring training, he's won 15 or more games in each of the last three years. He gets diagnosed with mononucleosis leaving Arizona and never misses a start. But then all of a sudden has back problems, has to undergo an epidural. He still never misses a start. But all of a sudden, with Cueto coming back, throwing the ball as well as really anybody in the entire league right now, Leak getting on a pretty good run here on a fourth consecutive quality start. Edinson Volquez was brought back a couple of days ago, had his best start of the year. And Travis Wood, 24-year-old left-hander, came here the other night against the Giants. Last night, went eight innings, allowed only one run. So, you know, the Reds feel like they're finally starting to get what was a, a very promising rotation going back before the year began and having everybody back in place well, and pitching well yeah and they're they're getting to where they expect it to be coming out of spring training that's why I say this Reds ball club you know with where they are now I I, I think in everything that they've had to deal with you, you've got to be excited as a Cincinnati Reds fan because things are going to get better a lot of it has to do again with, with that man right there, Dusty Baker, and his ability to keep everybody upbeat, to keep everything positive in that clubhouse, to look at the big picture. Like I said, I, I had an opportunity to play for him in 2003. He's as good as there is. Burris a fly ball to right, and Mike Leak, seven innings of four hit shutout baseball. Reds will bat in the eighth, leading 8 nothing. Series. Strike one to Drew Stubbs. Couple of other changes for the Giants over at third base. Connor Gillespie. And at first is Chris Stewart. Stewart started the game behind a plate here last night. Bruce Dubs, one of two, has struck out, walked twice, scored twice, and doubled his last at bat. Stubbs gone swinging. We told you Brandon Phillips wearing a microphone, and he's giving it to Chris Rose, our Fox Sounds of the game. Johnny Gall had the best mohawk ever, especially when he used to put the jail in and make it stand up. Hey, tell him, Johnny. Already, but Johnny had that mohawk on deck. Hey, man, nice suit, man. Where's the orange tie? Can't pull it off today. He is something. For those of us who have a, a chance to be around him on a daily basis, he is... Just He's really a breath of fresh air. Yeah, positive energy. Just yep. make you feel good talking to him, watching him. You know, he, he comes from a uh, a family in Georgia. This Brandon Phillips, his mom and dad have been married nearly 25 years, longer than 25. You nearly 30 years, and uh, you know, they come to Cincinnati frequently. They're in at least once every homestand. And uh, Chris Rose, you tell me, you know, you bounce around baseball just like we do. Uh, maybe I'm a little too close to it. I don't know. But uh, of all the guys that you've been around, have you met a more fan-friendly guy, genuine fan-friendly guy than Phillips? Not one bit, Tommy. I mean, we ran a piece in the pregame show last week about his, his Twitter account, and you, you mentioned it at the beginning of this broadcast. I mean, the guy 
does these amazing giveaways. You know, he really rallies the fans. He's done an amazing job of breaking down the barrier between professional athlete and fan because I think that gap has gotten wider over the years because of the financial disparity between the two groups. But he's a guy that really seemingly brings people together. The only thing I don't like about him is that his fashion sense stinks. He, well, he wanted my, to know where's your orange tie. That's yeah, a was, legitimate question. He was ripping my tie. He's like, that tie stinks. I was like, dude, I, <laughs> I bought this last year for the All-Star game. He says, you should never wear it again. I was like, I'm not big baller money like you. i got to repeat at least once a season. That's funny. I, mean, I thought he was being complimentary of your orange tie. Uh, he, liked the, he liked the suit. He, uh, actually, yeah, he, he saw an old orange tie. He wanted me to wear it again. Okay. I can't do that. You were telling a story earlier uh, about you know, Phillips on his uh, Twitter flying a couple of fans out here to San Francisco. Not only that, he you know, picked up the tab for their plane, their hotel, tickets to the game. Spent about half a day with the two young men yesterday. Today, let everybody know that uh, you know, he's going to be wearing the microphone here on Fox. But a few weeks ago, and, and Chris Rose told that story during our pregame show. You know, one of his Twitter followers, uh, a young boy, 14-year-old boy, said, Hey, I, Brandon, I'm sure you have nothing going on today. Ha, ha, ha. But I have a high school baseball game. And the next thing you know, Phillips is at the game. <laughs> uh, it's great. I mean, as Chris mentioned, the interaction with the fans. But, you know, with some of the other guys, remember, they got families, they're married. We have to mention Brandon is single. He's got some free time. You're right about that. I can't remember what that means. Free time <laughs> to you. <laughs>
All right, Tommy, just like Mike Leake against the Giants, Cliff Lee is tossing a gem against the Chicago Cubs this afternoon. Seven strikeouts in seven innings so far to give him in the National League best 107 on the year. He's given up just one run so far. The NL East leading Phillies leading the Cubs 2-1 this one in the seventh. Back on upstairs to Tom and EK. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Two down, and here's Cody Ross. Reds have Jose Arredondo lightly getting warmed up in the bullpen. He'll probably take a little time to get ready. They may bring him on in the ninth. Giants have action in their pen. Left-hander Javier Lopez. Ross one of only two Giants to reach second base against Mike Leak today. Leak has been that good. You know they go about it in very different ways. Leak is never going to be a big strikeout pitcher although he does have seven of them in the game here today. But you're getting a look at what the Reds believe this young man is just 23 years old. He walked out as a college senior right into the big leagues. And they really shut him down once he got to a certain point last year. His ERA is very misleading this year. He has had two really bad starts. But everything else has been very good. Well, he keeps the hitters off balance. He misses the barrel of the bat. He's tough to square up. As a hitter, you're not intimidated. You're not walking up to the mat or the, the batter's box thinking, oh man, I gotta face Mike Leak. But I think Sometimes he can use that to his advantage because you go up there, you, you tend to be maybe a bit more aggressive. As you mentioned he doesn't have overpowering stuff. He's not per se a strikeout guy, but what he is, he's a guy that's going to hit the end of the bat. He's a guy that's going to jam it. You're not going to have that good, solid swing against him. Well, that is strike three, and that caps off an outstanding performance by Leak. Eight innings, eight strikeouts, four hits, and most importantly, not a single run. Meaning a fourth straight outstanding start for Mike Leake since being brought back up from the minor leagues. Yeah, you mentioned an outstanding start. We were just looking for a quality start. At least Dusty Baker was looking for a quality start. He got more than that today from Mike Lee. You know, two starts now where he's gone eight innings. Gives that bullpen a break. But I think most important, that's four starts after coming up from the minor leagues where you didn't really know what you were going to get. You were hoping to get quality starts but I think he's been a lot more than everybody thought he'd be since he's come back really given a boost to the Cincinnati Red Ball Club Jay Bruce one out of four at a hit scored a run the first run of the game knocked in a run in the third the last beat backing up on it and makes the catch but it's one of the classic moments in all star history 1934 low grounds Giants lefty Carl Hubble struck out five consecutive future Hall of Famers Ruth Jimmy Fox on that list Joe Cronin was this the greatest moment in all star history we'll join the Midsummer Classics debate and check out the bracket MLB.com slash moments to cast your ballot this one's going up against Dave Parker's throw from right field back in the All-Star game of 1979. And of course a lot of Giants fans are going to log on and they're going to vote for Hubble. A lot of Cincinnati are going to log on and vote for Parker because Parker born and raised in Cincinnati still makes his home back there. We well, still in great shape. That guy walks into a room and you're like that's just a big who's man. that dude. <laughs> He was physically imposing when he played. Very athletic.
Certainly Parker put up numbers that are um, Hall of Fame caliber numbers. Well, this Pirates team had some off the field issues which certainly clouded you know, the way some people might perceive you know, some of the players from that team but you can't take away what Dave Parker did. I mean as far as an all around player athlete. I don't know if there's been a better all around player than Dave Parker. There are guys who have bigger numbers longer careers but in terms of hitting hitting for average power defense throwing the ball stealing bases. Well, you, you talk about guys that look imposing when they get into a batter's box. You're going to just the ball is going to get smoked somewhere and as a fielder you're just going oh man I hope this thing isn't hit to me. I he was that type of hitter. He just got in there. It looked like he was swinging a twig, which he wasn't. It was a big bat, but because of his presence, and then the way the ball would come off that bat. Last thing you, last place you wanted to be was holding the runner on first base with him up at the plate. And for those who don't remember, Parker was a left-handed batter. Thus, the first baseman was not very comfortable down. No, no, no. They said the same thing about the great Giant Hall of Famer Willie McCovey. There's another nice play. Guy brought his glove. We brought it up earlier. They do that a lot around here. And of course, the best part, he gets the girl at the end. Oh, look at that. Wow. And you get the kiss. Wow. Oh, that's living right. Two away in the inning. For more on the Reds, let's check in with Ken Rosenthal. Tom, Eric, if the Reds wanted to get creative, they could trade one of their catchers for starting pitching help and promote their top catching prospect, Devin Mezzarocco, who is hitting 330 at AAA. Of course, the combination of Ramon Hernandez and Ryan Hannigan is one of the team's great strengths. And the Reds might not want to disrupt the chemistry between their pitchers and catchers. Two other prospects, shortstop Zach Cozart and left fielder Yonder Alonso, could figure in the team's plans soon. Both are hitting well at AAA, and both play positions where the Reds currently are getting limited production. That sums it up right there to a T from Ken Rosenthal. I mean, the Reds have one of the richer farm systems, especially at the higher levels. Their best players in the very future of the franchise outside of guys like Votto and Bruce and Fedor at Triple A. You, you know, but when you talk about breaking up that tandem that's behind the plate right now, I think why both of those guys are successful is because they have one another. And if you decide to trade one to, to try and improve your ball club somewhere, better be darn sure you're going to get better because I think that the way that Dusty Baker has utilized both of those guys Hernandez and Hannigan is a big reason for each is each of their success. Eric let me turn this question around the other way. If you're one of these many perceived young studs however in the Reds minor league system they drafted you they've developed you from where you're sitting in their triple-a case Louisville Kentucky and you're only an hour and a half away from Cincinnati I mean you're getting regular news on what the major league club is doing every single day in Louisville yeah there's no question but as a minor league player you know, your job and, and, and what you have to really focus on doing is just going out and playing every day and you're playing for one of 30 clubs. You're not playing just for that organization that you're in. Because the flip of a switch you can be traded. And if you can you can get up or you can get real depressed when you've got an all-star playing ahead of you at the big league level. And you can think, oh, I should be in the big leagues. I you can't worry about it. And you know, I'm speaking from experience. I had a Hall of Famer playing ahead of me in Los Angeles and I was wearing out the minor leagues. But Eddie Murray was at first base. 
quite frankly at the time I and I think we all when we're in the minor leagues we're just looking for an opportunity mm -hmm. somewhere. Well Yanish has all of a sudden come alive here his last couple of at bats. Couple of hits in an RBI and they're loaded with two men out and the Reds are going to send up a pinch hitter Drew up. Talked about him earlier just up the road in Petaluma California Johnny Gomes. Well he has been swinging well as of late as you mentioned earlier in the show that. He's a guy that. Dusty Baker had hoped could separate those two left handed bats in the lineup Votto and Jay Bruce. Very effective last year and a guy that when he gets hot. You know, he can carry a ball club. I mean he's that he's a streaky type player. Despite all of his troubles and he just got his batting average up over 200 with a three hit night two days ago. Gomes does have eight home runs and 26 runs batted in. I mean you stick his RBI production on his giant team. And all of a sudden he's among the best hitters on the club. Well comparatively speaking but remember you know Johnny Gomes is playing in a, in a ballpark that yep. ball jumps. And he had a number of those home runs early six I believe six home runs in the first 18 days. Mm -hmm. But again he's a guy that. I think Dusty Baker feels that he hasn't got to where he's eventually going to be. He's going to play a huge role offensively on this ball. Play. Well the question does become though and Ken Rosenthal touched about on it a moment ago. Yonder Alonzo the Reds number one pick three years ago out of Miami drafted as a first baseman. Has been forced to go out and play left field because. The reigning minor league player of the year for the Reds who they believe will be their everyday left fielder maybe as early as next year in their leadoff hitter named Dave Sapel. But Sapel got hurt earlier this year. So Alonzo has gone to the outfield and it gets into the age old debate. Alonzo right now is hitting up over 330 big power driving in runs but he's not a real good defender. So you ask the question what would you rather have in your lineup. Well and you know I think with this Reds ball club. I've got to play some defense. I, I, I've got I, I think offensively they're they're a very capable team and there are going to be some guys that continue to get better. That's the third walk of the inning by Lopez that'll bring in a run. To make it nine to nothing. You know Cincinnati is not a big ballpark. It's not like you need. It's not as spacious as is here AT and T. I think that Alonzo, you you could you could play left field if you needed him to. But again, I'm for the Reds. I'm helping out my pitchers. I'm playing some D. Nine runs, 12 hits for the Reds. Lopez has walked three batters here in the inning. And now faces Drew Stubbs. And he's fallen behind him 2 0. Two and one on Stubbs, who scored a couple of runs, walked twice, has a double. Two and two. Well, the Reds and Giants will wrap up the series tomorrow night. Cincinnati will then travel south. Three game series beginning Monday in Los Angeles. Giants. We'll go to Arizona, the team right behind them in the National League West, to open a three game series in Phoenix Tuesday. Then they come right back to the Bay Area. They're in one of those stretches, and they have them every year because you play Oakland home and home. Where for really about a three week run, they're only out of town, if you will, for six games. 
Those are the games in St. Louis. They're in the middle of a 10 game homestand. They'll go to Arizona, come right back to the Bay Area, open another homestand. Three and two on Stubbs. So the schedule right now is very, very good for the Giants. But can they withstand all these injuries? And can their offense start to produce runs? Well, I think with the, the arrival of Sandoval next week, put him in this lineup, gives Boach a, a little more versatility. Again, we talk about injuries, and the starting staff remain the mutual. Well, that's it for Lopez. He'll leave in favor of Jeremy Affel. He walks four batters, two of them with the bases loaded. And the Reds lead 10 0. Beautiful Saturday afternoon. Reds have the bases loaded, and a former Red, Jeremy Affelt, takes over on the mound to face Brandon Phillips. Diving play at short, and a throw is in time to get the runner. That's a nice play by Manny Burris. Red score twice. Giants bat in the bottom of the ninth. Ten nothing game. All three of those losses for Fisher have come in extra inning games. Talked about him last week. The closer for their AAA team. The Reds went through that stretch where he used 19 pitchers in 17 days. And in that 19 inning game in Philadelphia, he had to throw five and two thirds innings out of the bullpen and almost 100 pitches. And from that moment on, he won unbelievable respect. From his manager and his teammates. But has taken a couple of other extra inning losses. It's time now for the Valvoline next gen right play of the game. Brandon Phillips, a two run double in that four run fifth to knock Lincecum out of the game. Very next batter would be the final of the game for Lincecum. RBI double by Votto to bring in Phillips. Well, Eric, it's been fun being with you here these uh, last three weeks. You'll uh, you know, throw me into the bay and make your way to Atlanta <laughs> and start hanging out with uh, you know, some of your other broadcast partners from time to time. Who are you with next week? I believe I'm with uh, Dick Stockton Very and Kenny nice. Albert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell them we said hello. Well, I've appreciated the three weeks watching this Reds ball club as well. I think both of these clubs today, Giants and the Reds, we're going to see in September and October. And I think we're going to see different versions of both of these ball clubs. I think the Reds, the pitching staff will get better. You get Chapman, Bailey, I think will fit in nicely. I think left field will probably solidify itself for the Cincinnati Red Ball Club. The Giants will get healthier. I think offensively they'll improve. Both of these ball clubs definitely on the radar for postseason baseball. Not had a single home run hit in this series between these two teams. For the Giants, that's not a surprise. They've only hit 11 home runs the entire year at home. And today is their, what, uh, 30th 
home game. The Reds, of course, are one of the big slugging teams in all the baseball and a hitter friendly ballpark at Great American Ballpark. But their team, it also hits home runs on the road. But against his staff and in this yard, that's not the name of the game. You know, it's not the name. It's not the name of the game, but it's one of the reasons of why the Reds can play well on the road. I mean, not necessarily the fact that you know they hit home runs in just about any ballpark, but they're not a one-dimensional team. They're a team that can also play defense. They're amongst the, the league leaders. And you come into a ballpark like this, you've got to catch the ball. You can't give away outs. You know, to score 10 runs in this ballpark, that's an anomaly. That doesn't happen. Of course, maybe some of the Giants should have watched uh, batting practice from some of the old timers they had earlier today. Well, what a great event this was. And how about Will the Thrill? Splash down. How big league is that? I, I'll guarantee you, Will's been hitting for the last two months getting <laughs> ready for this game today. Uh, he came out and he was swinging it. Still as sweet as ever. Well, what a hitter he was. They'll always remember that 1989 National League Championship Series around here. When Will Clark seemingly was getting hits and driving in runs every time he walked to the plate. No, it was it was Will Clark versus our colleague Mark Grace. I mean, mm -hmm. both of them young first baseman and both put on you know phenomenal hitting exploits. And here we talk about a lack of a home run, and there's the first one in the series. So the shutout bid by the wayside as Pearl hits a two-run home run here in the ninth. Well, that's what Pat Pearl does. You see, look at the extension, the contact. The back elbow is bent, but he continues through the ball. Drives that ball into the left center field seats. First home run since April the 18th for Burrow. And you'll see that very much. Sign from the umpire, home run. Not in this part. One and one on Eli Whiteside. And now two balls and a strike. Giannis. And that one gets by Vado. That'll be an infield hit for Whiteside. Yonish does a nice job of getting to the ball. Just doesn't get up real clean. He makes a good, strong throw. But it's one of those in betweeners for a first baseman. Not close enough to Botto for the short hop, and not far enough away to get the long hop. Still only one out in the Giants' ninth inning, and here's Bill Hall, and Fisher has fallen behind ball one.
Of course, this would be a comeback that would be beyond extraordinary. I mean, they've seen comeback win after comeback win after comeback win here at AT&T Park. But most of the games, a lot like last night. 3-2, scoring in the bottom of the ninth inning. To put up their 36th win of the year against 28 losses. I mean, the only thing right now, if you're the Giants, you're just trying to get down to first base, maybe get another guy up in the bullpen for the Reds. Two and two to Bill Hall. And now the Reds are indeed forced to get another reliever up throwing in a bullpen as Fisher issues a one out walk, allows a home run, gives up an infield hit, and now a pitch away from another walk. Coming in for the second out, and the Giants down to their final out of the afternoon. <laughs> Manny Burr is for four. We talked about Sandoval more than likely coming back when the Giants hit the road to go to Arizona to begin a three game series on Tuesday night. And this ought to do it. So the Giants are going to need Sandoval back. Start scoring a little more frequently today. They were just simply shut down by Mike Lee. Reds rough up Tim Lincecum. And we'll wrap things up from San Francisco right after these messages from your local Fox station 10 2. The Reds win it.